Hi everyone, let's continue our discussion of systems of memory by examining the Yoruba faith, especially Ifa divination. When we talk about systems of memory, like in the last lecture, we're referring to those kinds of practices a culture has as a way of retaining its cultural knowledge, especially important when that culture doesn't have a written language to rely on. Now, lots of cultures have cultural artifacts or cultural forms that help them recall important cultural features and ideas. But these things are brought into very sharp focus when there is a long history, very little or limited literacy. Because literacy really changes the way people perceive culture and their identity. This idea of a repository of written texts that contain this knowledge makes people feel less urgent about recording it elsewhere. And so in systems of memory, we see this kind of complex way in which society encodes cultural knowledge into artifacts, actions, dances, and other traditional practices. Now, we're going to talk about the Yoruba quite a bit in this section. They're a very important culture in West Africa. They are a very large population. About 40 million of them live in Nigeria, and smaller populations can be found in Benin and Togo. Yoruba religious beliefs are really quite extraordinary, and they're quite diverse. It's a polytheistic society with a kind of the idea that there is this kind of large, single, all-powerful deity, but that it is, in a sense, sort of the multifaceted uh, lesser deities which really play in on everybody's or, uh, common lives. And so it's these uh, messengers and other kinds of minor deities that really are the ones that people are addressing their prayers and concerns to. One of the famous cultural gods and deities is Shango, who is the thunder god in Yoruba. And people have uh, long prayed to him in, in, in these sort of trance uh, dances that people use. And they have these wands here. And, and like in a lot of Yoruba faith, we don't see Shango uh, represented except for this sort of axe-shaped crown that's on the top of this woman's head, that is sort of the symbol of the thundercloud. The woman is the devotee, and the thundercloud is kind of coming down into her head. It's a kind of spiritual center that is sort of bringing her into her um, body as a kind of devotee of Shango. Devotees of Shango are typically represented as women because Shango is male. To be a woman and to be a devotee of Shango, you are sort of receiving his power and kind of he's making you female so you can have this special intimate relationship with him. So Yoruba Shango uh, does have a lot of uh, priestesses who are the people who are conducted the rituals for Shango, but there are also men involved in this as well. Another very interesting feature of the Yoruba society is the extraordinary prevalence of twins. Twins are quite more common in Yoruba than they are in, elsewhere in the world. And it's not quite clear why that is the case, but say, for example, in the United States, twins exist about one in every 33 births in the United States, uh, whereas in Yoruba, it's one in every 22. The other problem that has you know, plagued Africa for, for quite a long time is developing countries and region. There are a lot of uh, infant mortality. And because it's believed that the twins share a soul, that they are con you know, deeply joined um, because they are born at the same time, when one twin dies, it becomes uh, very important for the mother to have an effigy whereby she can maintain a kind of childlike representation of that deceased child and feed it and clothe it and adorn it in a way that it, it continues to live alongside the living child. 
And this Ere Ibeji, the way in which the the Yoruba twins are honored this way, uh, the mother, you know, proudly presents her deceased twin and her care for it is a part of her undying devotion to her uh, living twin. Oyo, it was the practice to kill twins for a long time with the help of a knife at the neck. For that time, people were distrustful of twins. They could not understand why a woman would give birth to two at the same time when she is not an animal nor a goat. And then there was this sort of this cultural change that occurs in Yoruba culture where they're, they're no longer considered dangerous or less than human. They're actually considered sort of sacred and they are considered a kind of an important embodiment of their uh, wor worship and practices. Fortunately, today, the sculptural forms that you see today, um, a lot of them are exceedingly rare. The figures tend to be diminutive. They hold so they can be tucked into somebody's clothing as they go about their day. Uh, but they usually have uh, adult uh, genitalia and other mask and filament and features, and they are usually decorated with beads or other small decorations to give them, uh, you know, a kind of a status as a, a, a very important being, a person. So these carved sculptures you'll see also have been rubbed with oil, so they have a kind of a reddish hue to them, and that often they've been rubbed with oil so often that many of the finer features have completely rubbed off. Today, it is, as I said, very rare to see these hand-carved ere ibeji. More often today, people uh, will simply go down to the store and buy a kind of plastic copy from China. And that is the nature of culture. Uh, it takes the path of least resistance. And so these are more commonly found now uh, in many Yoruba areas. Another very interesting idea in uh, Yoruba faith and practice is the concept of ashe. Ashe is uh, intrinsically related to the essential nature of creativity called iwa which is perceptible to those who have walked with the ancestors and thus acquired a critical and discerning eyes. Important to Iwa are Ojo Inu, the inner eye, or the artist's insight, and Ojo Ona, the external harmony of artworks. For Yoruba, beauty of objects, performances, or texts lies not only in what catches the eye, but also in the ashe derived from the work's completeness. So this concept of ashe is sort of reflected in this idea of something that's alluring, something compelling, but it also has this idea of cool, I mean, like cold. Um, some people have suggested, because there's a, a very long tradition of African Americans who um, trace their origins back to Yoruba country, that this concept that we have, you know, this idea of, hey, that's cool, actually is sort of anciently related to this idea of ashe, which means something cold. Now, to represent this idea of something being cool, having this kind of power, this attractive power, this creative, vital essence, um, the color blue was considered to be a really rare and, and um, volatile form of expression. But there really wasn't any natural source of blue until came this a uh, laundry soap called Ricketts Crown Blue, which was a laundry whitener, was first widely marketed uh, by Rickett and Sons, which was established way back in 1840 by a Quaker named Isaac Rickett. And it was brought and, and traded and is still today available in Africa. And it has been used as this kind. So sometimes you will see, you know, these Yoruba statues with their uh, very striking, uh, dramatic figures here. Uh, a woman on horseback, surrounded by musicians, and a child in front of her, and a rooster in one hand, and this sort of bold blue color is this kind of arresting sense of dramatic coolness. So those are some of the um, general features of Yoruba culture. Like I said, we'll talk a lot about Yoruba uh, in this section because they are so important to West African cultural identity. 
I also want to talk about one of the important ways in which their religious practices are disseminated and remembered, and that is through Ifa divination, which requires an awful lot of different kinds of equipment. It is a very uh, long tradition of being made in a very specific way. The Ifa divination is uh, conducted by a Babalahu, who is a person who undergoes extensive training in memorizing some 256 different kinds of passages correlating to different arrangements uh, that might come up in a divination. And so to memorize all these different texts and make sure you got them accurate and recite them carefully and then be able to interpret them effectively for the listener, this is a part of an extraordinary status to have this knowledge and to be diviner. Diviners usually hang out in the market area. They parade to the market early in the morning all at once, and they set up their, their area, and people come to them uh, with questions regarding you know, personal troubles or you know, big decisions like marriage or travel or jobs or whatever it might be. And so by consulting the Babalowo, they are consulting someone whom they can trust to access uh, this sacred knowledge. Instead of the Babalawa, they do not live in the village where they come, but they literally travel about. They are constantly sort of on the move. Uh, being itinerant fortune tellers, they have a important job, but one that is sort of the, the mystique of their trade provides them with a certain kind of person who is not from this area, and is sort of this uh, someone who has a kind of insight into the, the mysterious beyond from outside the borders of their everyday life. And this is a very interesting idea that this uh, diviner is somehow uh, out from elsewhere. And I think it's really important because it comes up a lot in studying divination. When you talk to people about why they divine, they'll say, oh, well, there's a diviner and he's just down the street, but I've seen this guy and He's just a he's just a fraud. He I've seen him working. He's he's he just but there's another guy on the other side of the mountain. Now he really knows his stuff. So this kind of distance that people need to grant a certain authenticity to the authority of the diviner is, is an interesting idea. The proximity of a diviner might make someone dismiss their their abilities. So how is Ifa divination done? As you see here, we have a Babalawo and he's sitting before a tray. And this is one of the important features. And the, the, the tray is where he'll mark the score that will eventually tell him what is going on. Now, there are a, lot, a couple of different ways of doing the divination. The most traditional way is you have these uh, sacred palm nuts, 16 of them, and then they are held in a bowl and the diviner will scoop them up quickly. And whether he scoops up an odd number or an even number will give him whether he puts one mark down or two marks down. Now he's marking with his hand with this dust in the tray. And the dust is not any old kind of dust. It's actually the excrement of termites because it's believed that termites uh, burrow deep in the ground that their excrement, their, the, the, the wood dust that they generate there is somehow closer to the spirit world. And so uh, you have the tray there and the nuts and the ajera ife bowl. So the, the tray is called the opon ife, and we'll talk more about that. Another very important instrument in the diviner's trade is the tapper. And the tapper has a, has a very specific function is in part uh, one of the most expensive elements of a diviner's craft, one that they will spend the most money to get the finest carving or the rarest materials, because it's really a symbol of their authority. The tapper, uh, the diviner simply uses to tap the edge of the divination tray. And this is a, needed to call the attention of the messenger of the god uh, Orun Mila. So the messenger needs to know that, hey, I'm about to do a divination. Please come down and pay attention and make sure the result 
is in accordance with the great god Orun Mila. Here is a very old divination tray. Most divination trays today are just circular. This one that has was collected by a visiting European way back in the 16th, 17th century. This tray has these side tray areas, and no one's quite sure what those would function as today. As there doesn't seem to be any equivalent trays still in use today. One of the features that it, you see in this tray is one that is quite common even today, and that is there is a head of a figure here at the very top of the board, and this um, looking out at us. This is the face of Ishu. He's the messenger to Orun Mila, and Ishu is the one who is going to be in attendance as this divination is taking place, and he's the one who will then take the message from Orun Mila and make sure that the divination represents represents what Orun Mila wishes for this person to know. So, yes, Orun Mila is the spirit of wisdom among the Orun Mole and the divinity of destiny and prophecy. So this is one of the older ways of doing this divination, a much more common way of doing it, much quicker, and certainly because it's quicker, less uh, venerated, and if you had a really important question, you might try and do something with the, the sacred. Here, this is the Odu Ifa. Um, this is, the, or, this is the, the chain method. And the chain, you see these sort of shell-like forms, uh, one that's curved and one that has a line on it. And when they just, they take the chain and then they quickly lay it down. And depending on where the chain falls, which shell is up, which is down, they read the signs and make a, the marks that they can do and understand the 256 Odu and rec recognize that. You can see here a picture of someone using the chain on their back of their divination bag. You also see that there's a fly whisk, which is also another very important part of the, the equipment for the diviner. So the diviner's bag is where a lot of the equipment is held. And a lot of this stuff is stored, and it is also this important symbol of status that the diviner carries. So the, the tapper they carry before them when they walk to the market, and the, the tapper is an indication of their great authority and their wealth. If they are a wealthy diviner, it is because they've had many, many important people pay them for their knowledge and wisdom. The divination bag we see here is actually, um, there's a variety of different kinds of divination bags and the designs vary, but they tend to be very brightly colored and very broadly multicolored. The idea of a divination bag is that it should represent a kind of, they say, a full spectrum of possibilities. And each of the colors that are in engaged in the divination bag um, have certain kinds of symbolism to them. So white, red, yellow, orange, pink, these are the kind of uh, dynamic, the sort of uh, the good and the bad, the, the right and the wrong, the up and the down, every kind of possible thing we need to consider is going to be considered uh, in this divination. The other thing that's really important about the divination bag is that it is designed with beads. Beads have historically been the exclusive province of nobility, and it is only the diviner who is given exception to this rule. So that by having beads on their divination bag, the diviner is demonstrating that they have a kind of royal office of sorts that allows them to speak with kings, that allows them to address and advise very important people about very serious issues. There are many different kinds of divination in Africa. Here's just one other kind of divination, the mouse divination, the gebert. And this is one that plays on a lot of similar ideas about divination that I want to ex expand on here. In mouse divination, the diviner sets up an interior space in this bowl. And in it, they carefully place 
different kinds of grains and different kinds of sticks and objects at different levels, sort of intricately creating a kind of design that reflects the ideal universe. And then what they do is they put a mouse into the top of the container, seal it up, and the mouse moves through the interior until it comes out toward the bottom. After it's sort of done its thing, they put the mouse away, they open it up, and the diviner then looks at how the mouse has disturbed what the contents of this container have. And it's this what they read to interpret in their divination. In this case, the logic of this has to do again with the kind of contagion. The fact that a mouse lives underground is sort of in the spirit world, closer to the spirit world underneath us. And so when they are placed in this container, that sort of rubs off on the objects. And the objects within the container sort of have a kind of similarity to things in our lives, in our world. And that is the homeopathic element. So you see all kinds of uh, ways in which uh, the ideas of homeopathy, that something similar, is suggesting the future, and contagion, something that lives within the spirit world and has access to spiritual powers, can come and manipulate these things in a meaningful way.